The following is a taster session from the University of Worcester School of Law. Hello everyone, my name is Josie Kemmies and I'm a lecturer in law at the University of Worcester School of Law. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the law surrounding murder as part of this taster lecture. Murder sits as a topic within our criminal law module uh, on the LLB, on the law degree. And it's studied by most of our uh, first years and also some of our second years who study law with another subject such as criminology or forensic psychology. So there are a few things that we'll do in this short session and some of them will begin to work towards these learning outcomes that you can see here on the screen. Um, we will talk about where the law relating to murder comes from. I'll just highlight this as we go. Uh, and the kind of offence it is. So you'll see here the phrase common law offence of murder. Uh, we will also have a look at how the offence of murder relates to other criminal offences, uh, such as manslaughter. And we'll also consider the elements of the offence of murder, which you can see here, and how those relate to one another. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by elements of the offence in a moment. Now, it's unlikely that we'll cover some of these wider points that you can see on the screen here, things such as evaluation of the elements, the rules of causation, or indeed uh, proposed reforms around homicide offences. But I wanted to show you how uh, the specific points we discuss sit within a much broader topic. OK, so when we study murder as part of the law degree, it sits within a group of criminal offences known as homicide offences, which is what you can see here on the screen. Uh, sometimes these are referred to as fatal offences, which you can contrast with, for example, non-fatal offences such as assault. So um, quite a significant difference, to say the least, uh, but also one that we use to differentiate different criminal behaviour. So let's take a look at an overview of the offences that we're talking about here and start to examine how murder fits into this bigger picture. OK, for anyone who has not studied any criminal law before, uh, it's useful, I think, to go through a couple of basic points before we get going into any detail about murder itself. Now, when we are looking at specific criminal offences, what we're doing is trying to work out when we apply that law to a particular scenario, we're trying to work out whether or not somebody is guilty. And when we use that phrase guilty, what we talk about, what we're really talking about is whether or not there is criminal liability for the acts or omissions that have occurred. And in broad terms, when we're looking at those sorts of things and we're looking at different kinds of offences, whether they be fatal offences, homicide offences such as these, or it could be property offences such as theft, we'll see that each offence contains, by and large, uh, two key elements. One is something called the actus reus. The actus reus refers to the guilty act, or indeed omission, by the defendant or defendants. And something called the mens rea, which is the guilty mind, the state of mind of the of the defendant or defendants. Now, in criminal law, we have to establish if we're trying to prove guilt and, and criminal liability, we have to we have to establish that those two elements are present. And every offence will have its own definition of what those elements are. So every offence has an actus reus and mens rea. But different offences will have different words and definitions of exactly what the act, actus reus, is or needs to be, and, and indeed the same with the mens rea. The third element to this that we, we need to talk less about, but we'll, we'll raise it here, is the fact that if you can show that the actus reus and mens rea are present, it doesn't mean automatically that criminal liability exists, but rather that 
um, we then have to consider the possibility that there is some sort of defence available. And that defence can sometimes reduce or entirely eliminate that criminal liability. So criminal law, when, when we start to look at the detail and we start to look at the specific offences, is actually really very technical and very specific. And of course, that's not surprising, really, given the, the severity and, and significance of some of these offences. And of course, murder is certainly no exception to that. So let's have a look at this table and and sort of think, begin to think a little bit about what I've just said there and what it means in practice. Now, we, we're talking today about murder as a, a criminal offence in its own right. And you can see here on the screen that we have um, the outline of the actus reus of murder. So this is the, the guilty acts required to start thinking that perhaps what we have here is, is murder. Um, and you'll see here it says unlawfully causing the death of a human being. Now we'll break that down a bit more in a moment, but broadly speaking, that is the actus reus of, of this offence of murder. And then you'll see underneath, we have another box here, mens rea, which contains the words intention to kill or cause GBH, grievous bodily harm. Now, in terms of what's going on here, the key word in that second box is intention, intention to take that on its own you don't actually need the, the killing or the GBH it's the intention to do those things when you couple that intention to do those things with the act which is above there of actually doing a killing as it were and causing the death of a human being in an unlawful manner then you have the requisite elements of murder OK, so hopefully from that you can see how we start to break down an offence that you know everybody will know that of, of murder and, and we'll have our very own understanding of what that means. But when we look at the law, you can really see that it's actually quite technical. And every single one of those words or, or parts of those definitions themselves require further elaboration and, and thought. But we won't do that just yet. One of the um, learning outcomes for this taster lecture was to try and understand the relationship between murder and other offences, and in particular, murder and manslaughter. Now, you can see from these other two columns on this slide that we have something called voluntary manslaughter and something called involuntary manslaughter. Now, voluntary manslaughter, you'll notice, contains the same two elements as murder. So you can see again, the actus reus is the same, and you can see also that the mens rea is the same. But we have an extra box here, and we have some illustration of what I was saying to you a little bit before about the, the existence of defences and how that affects whether or not somebody's guilty of certain offences or, or whatever it might be. Now, if one looks and sees based on evidence and such like, that there is all the, the, the evidence there pointing towards murder and these elements that we see on the screen. If, however, a defendant is able to establish the existence of something called a partial defence, then they can reduce their, their potential conviction for, man, uh, for murder, sorry, for murder, to one of voluntary manslaughter murder to manslaughter. The voluntary part is significant because we still have that intention, the intention to kill, or the intention to cause grievous bodily harm and the death that has occurred, but the circumstances are different and are, are such that if, for example, it's shown that the defendant successfully argues diminished responsibility, then they have, they have acted in that way with that intention but there's mitigating factors. Uh, we won't get into those defences. That's a separate lecture in its own right, if not several. Um, but hopefully you can see there that additional element. And that additional element is what changes murder to voluntary manslaughter. We then move to our third column across, the one 
titled involuntary manslaughter. Now here we've got a bit of a difference again. You'll see that the um, actus reus is the same. So the acts that have occurred are all the same, but there's some changes around how we interpret that based on, on well, on evidence ultimately. What we have here for involuntary manslaughter, so we have the actus reus of murder again, but we don't have the necessary intention. So these are circumstances in which defendants did not intend to kill or did not intend to cause grievous bodily harm, but where death has occurred as a result. Um, and there are actually a number of different types of involuntary manslaughter. Um, for example, corporate manslaughter or gross negligence uh, manslaughter. So where a killing occurs due to somebody's gross negligence, extreme carelessness. Um, or unlawful act manslaughter, which is, for example, where somebody is in the process of committing another criminal offence, let's say a robbery, and as a result of various things that occur in that uh, series of events, somebody dies. They've intended to perhaps rob. Um, they never intended to kill or cause GBH, but it's, but it's happened. And sometimes we might need to impose liability for that uh, where, where that's the case. So if you just look across this overview, you can see that um, already that there's a number of technical differences between these offences, but also there's broader points to think about around things like sentencing, things like, um, you know, how people perceive murder versus manslaughter in terms of convictions and so on and so forth. But um, but plenty for us to think about. And, and what we'll do now is we'll, we'll unpack a little bit more about murder um, and, and, and have to leave the others for another day. This slide is um, less focused on the law surrounding murder and, and um, more really about the context of the law that we're studying. Um, now, of course, the usual caveats exist around statistics, but we have an awful lot of statistics about uh, various criminal offences and homicide, of course, is no different. Um, and while we don't spend a huge amount of time looking at these in any detail, I think sometimes it's quite useful to look at the, the big picture, the environment in which the law and the very specific technical parts of the law that you study operate within. Um, and this is sort of bridging the gap really between studying law and learning about it and then really starting to think about things like practicing it. And, and what that would entail. So really just a brief mention about that, nothing hugely significant to say, um, other than sometimes it's, it's helpful not to study law in isolation. And similarly here, this is again just a brief note really to highlight a couple of things about studying law at university. Um, these are slides taken from uh, part of our, our lecture that we give to first and second years on, on murder um, and these are some questions that we place really as thinking points. Um, so going back to those learning outcomes at the start, we were talking about I think evaluation and, and proposed re law reform and things like that. These questions here, is the current law fit for purpose? Are mens rea thresholds sufficient? What are the challenges relating to establishing causation? These are the kinds of critical questions that we start to help you uh, answer and also think about um, as part of your study on the law degree. So you have, I suppose, the academic skills that, that we equip you with at university, but also the legal skills that should you choose to go on and practice law one day, will entail things like critical thinking, uh, evaluation that we've mentioned, but also analysis and reflection. Um, and these questions don't necessarily have right answers. They're more about prompting discussion uh, and maybe even debate, depending on how strongly people feel about them. OK, so let's now take a look at murder itself and some of those specific points that we mentioned in the overview a little bit before. One of the interesting things about the offence of murder, which 
sets it aside from many other criminal offences, certainly many other very serious criminal offences, is that it's what we call a common law offence. Now, what this means is that the definition of what murder is and, and how it occurs is created and established by the courts, by the common law. And the common law is formed of, of decisions of judges in different courts on different issues um, where they set precedent, the system of, the system of precedent that uh, exists within the English legal system. So given the severity of murder as one of the most serious criminal offences that we know of, it is interesting that it is, it is still found within the common law as opposed to being codified and located in statute. And what that means is that Parliament have legislated and set out the offence in an Act of Parliament as opposed to judges in the courts defining and setting out the offence as part of their judgment. So that's quite an interesting feature about, about this law. It doesn't change anything because that's where it is, but it's interesting to know that as a, as a, a sort of background point really. And the definition of murder that we use today, albeit with a few tweaks in the, uh, in the language, is one that was established in the 17th century by Sir Edward Cook. And you can see it here on the screen. Uh, murder is when a man of sound memory and of the age of discretion unlawfully killeth within any country of the realm any reasonable creature in rerum natura under the king's peace with malice aforethought. Well, what does, on earth does that mean? Let's take a look at what that means and how it's been interpreted in more recent times on the following slide. Okay, so this slide here is really setting out just a little bit more clearly and in a little bit more space what we saw on the uh, on the overview that we looked at. But the elements of murder, and if you think back to what we were saying at the start of this lecture about criminal offences and the, the need for an actus reus and mens rea, um, we can see here how, how this offence is split up. Now, in, uh, in terms of Sir Edward Cook's uh, definition, um, of course, the language has been updated to, to be more relevant to the language we use today, although that's not always the case with law. Sometimes the, the language is a little bit different. But in terms of establishing the actus reus, as we were saying before, we're thinking here about whether or not we can show um, using the criminal standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt that somebody has unlawfully caused the death, killed uh, a human being in the Queen's peace. And then, or as well as, we also have to establish that they did so with that phrase malice aforethought. Now malice aforethought uh, is, an, is, an old, is an old part of that definition. Um, and we tend now to use the phrases intention to kill or intention to cause GBH because that's more in line with the language that, that's used within the criminal law. But we'll look at these in a little bit more detail and um, just elaborate a little bit more on, on how they work. But hopefully you can start to see how this is all sort of um, building up to, 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 to make clear the elements of murder and this offence of murder that we in some ways are so familiar with already. Okay, so let's take a look at the actus reus of murder. So let's take a look at the elements of the actus reus then of murder. And and, and this is where you, I think you'll get a feel for how technical and how detailed uh, study of law can be. Um, we started off with the big broad offence of murder. We then broke it down into the elements, the actus reus and mens rea. And then we've started now to break down each of those two broad elements into separate parts and this is the case for every criminal offence you'll have to go through this process so for murder the actus reus of murder when we use the phrase unlawfully causes death of human being dot 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 that's fine but when you uh, have a particular case or you have a set of facts a scenario that has happened sometimes it's not clear whether what you see in front of you constitutes unlawful or constitutes human being because sometimes circumstances don't fit neatly into a definition and you have to try and interpret them uh, and it's it's the job of the courts by and large to do that interpretation and that's what you you get from various court decisions judicial decisions is you get clarification of certain points of law 
and it's never all at once it's, it's very incremental and very detailed which is why you end up having to read lots of cases and lots of judgments to, to try and establish what what the um, the current law might be but that's what's happened here so with all of these elements of murder there's been time given to interpreting what do we mean by unlawfully now very simply we mean that we can't consider the killing to be lawful and that means that it can't be justified in law now if for example somebody were acting in self-defense a they would have a defense self-defense is one of our general defenses in criminal law but also that defense acts as a justification an explanation and a justification for why they've killed somebody and if they can prove the elements of self-defense then it justifies in law the killing and renders it lawful as opposed to unlawful but those circumstances are really very narrow because of course what what the, the law doesn't really want is to to allow too much freedom uh, in terms of killing because it's so serious an offence. We then have to establish that that killing, that unlawful act, uh, causes death and this is, there's a whole heap of law around this that we won't get into today um, where you have to establish the link between what the defendant has done and the outcome in terms of the death uh, of a human being and there's lots and lots of law and lots of rules that go in amongst all of that to try and establish that link because if it is established the consequences are very severe so causes death and we have rules to go with that um, of a human being now you might think well that's really straightforward but the the, the big questions around this exist around um, human beings so babies who have yet to be born who are in the womb and also people who are um, unfortunately classed as, as brain dead so medically brain dead and it's questions around um, liability and it's questions around existence of, for example, are you can you be killed if you are not yet born? Um, so really big, really big, complex and, and quite sensitive questions to consider, but they need to be considered. And so you have cases where, where that's been discussed. The phrase in the Queen's Peace, it would change if we had a king on the throne uh, to the King's Peace, but this basically provides an exception for wartime um, to permit uh, killing in that circumstance and there used to be and it's been abolished now something called the year in a day rule um, which was basically limiting the amount of time at which somebody may possibly be, be convicted of murder to a year in a day but now we have um, a longer a longer limit and actually it's unlimited if the Attorney General permits a prosecution because of things like the advances in medical science of DNA and so on and so forth and, and the ability to show links between something that happened probably a bit longer ago okay so you can see again that we've we've broken this down much further and there's lots of things big things there to think about um, as we do so so on the previous slide we saw the, the one before that um, the need to show that the defendant has caused the the death of a human being and I was saying to you it's, this is about this link well within that pocket of law there is in fact a, another uh, set of rules and we have to establish things in terms of fact and evidence we also apply legal reasoning and sort of legal principles in terms of how much or the extent to which somebody should be found as the cause of death um, and we also have a, a body of exceptions where if you can show that someone the link between the defendant's act or omission and the death uh, we have a, a body of rules that that sort of recognize certain other things that might ha impact um, upon that and they're called novus actus interveniens intervening acts that break that link um, and there's lots of different things there but generally they are quite exceptional things albeit things that um, should or, sh or shouldn't for that matter uh, allow a defendant to be absolved of their liability um, but again like I say that, that that's a, a substantial discussion in itself mens rea of murder 
Okay, so here we would uh, have a little bit more of a discussion about the mens rea. So this is the guilty mind element of, of the offence of murder. And we talked about, about the phrase malice of forethought, and, and I alluded to the fact that it had come under some criticism. Um, it's now deemed to be something of a misleading and inaccurate term to use. And part of the reason for that is because it indicates and suggests that it's necessary to have some form of premeditation um in in relation to the offense of murder and and in fact that that doesn't catch all of the circumstances in which murders occur so um it's it was thought to be an unhelpful way of talking about the mens rea requirement for murder um and in still instead sorry we use this phrase intention to kill or intention to cause gbh um and it's what the defendant is intending to do wanting to do um and then you couple that, of course, with what they actually do do, uh, or not for that matter. Um, there, there's lots of discussion here around the nature of that intention uh, and, and the reasons why people wish to uh, kill another human being. Um, and the topic of, of mercy killings um, is, is challenging for the law in terms of um, the intention behind a killing so uh, you know all the all the debates around euthanasia um and whether or not somebody wanted to uh, in this case the, the the mother in 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 this case the defendant wanted to um uh, turn off the life support machine for her son because she didn't want him to suffer anymore but in in terms of murder and how the law currently stands that that technically is still intention to kill regardless of the motive behind it or the reasons behind it um so again that's perhaps thinking a little bit about the context of the law surrounding murder as well now i won't say too much here because uh this again is is really quite a substantial area of the criminal law um suffice to say that when we trying when we're trying to establish that intention that mens rea intention to kill or intention to cause gbh we assess it subjectively so we try to establish what it is the defendant was thinking at the time now there's different forms that this intention can take sometimes a defendant will definitely intend that particular outcome they do this because they want that to happen sometimes it's less straightforward it's less direct and we have to consider something called oblique intent um and the, the test for that is found in a case called woolen here court of appeal judgment and and i'll i'll talk to you a little bit about this briefly just as a way of showing you how we use cases and so on so this test that we use to assess whether or not there is intention um is generated through a judicial decision, a court of appeal decision in Woolin. Um, and this points, these points here, one and two, uh, give us the test. They give us the way to do that. So if there's a question around whether a defendant has intended to kill or intended to cause GBH or intended to do anything else for that matter, but um, in terms of murder, then the jury may find intention may find intention where, first of all, death or serious injury was a virtual certainty as a result of the actions of the defendant. And then secondly, whether the defendant appreciated that this was the case. So that's for the job the, the that's a job for the jury to, to to carry out based on the evidence that they've heard. So huge huge amounts to think about, uh, all lots, you know, in their own right lots to think about. But um nevertheless very interesting when you start to delve a bit deeper into the detail. Okay, so we've reached the end of this taster lecture. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. There is far too much uh, law and discussion to have around all of these points that we've covered um, than we have time for. However, uh, I hope that it's given you an overview and a taste of the sorts of questions and points of law and discussions that we might have if studying this in a bit more detail. And of course, this is only one part of criminal law and, and, and criminal law is only one part of a law degree. But um, many of those uh, qualities and characteristics carry across any subject of, of thinking critically, of evaluating, of, of wondering about different scenarios or even arguing a specific point. So we've taken a look at murder 
um, but we've thought about it in relation to, to manslaughter. We've talked quite a lot about the actus reus and mens rea elements of, of the, the offence and how they relate to one another. And I think also uh, that we've unpacked the many details and many layers of the law in this area that we would have to get to grips with um, as part of the degree and indeed if we went on to practice this in um, legal practice. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed things. And uh, of course, you're always very welcome to get in touch with us at the School of Law if you if you have any questions. Thanks.